with you. In these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This may be an appropriate question, or I should say a more appropriate question for me to ask maybe after tonight, um, depending on the outcome of tonight's game. But have you ever had a fight with a close friend or a family member? You know, those kind of those situations that pop up and things kind of get awkward after it. I mean, it could be sort of an argument. It could just be a disagreement about things. Sometimes maybe you are even at someone else's house and those, those moments pop up and then you kind of have to go through that whole thing. Um, you know, sometimes those are very petty things. Sometimes there are things that will upset us or get us into like tension or arguments or fights that are over very petty things like a football game that in the grand scheme of things really don't matter. You know, sometimes it can be um, things that are very important that, that we kind of have these, these arguments or this conflict or tension about. And it can be a specific situation. It can be about something that's really going on, uh, maybe how it was handled or how a person reacted to the situation. Sometimes it can just be about a person's general attitude or their change in character. No one, no one likes those situations when we kind of get into those times. And I'll admit it, I, and I think I've shared this before, I don't like conflict. Conflict. I'm not a very good person when it comes to conflict. Um, I find that sometimes when, when conflict kind of surprises me and I find myself in a situation where there's tension and conflict, I don't always react the best. I find myself sometimes maybe overreacting or looking back on the situation thinking, oh, I should have, I wish I would have, and I don't really take the time to really uh, maybe very uh, properly handle the situation. There's other times that I know that conflict is coming, maybe a situation that I know is sort of like scheduled, like like a meeting or whatever, or maybe there's just like another time that I know that being around certain people or in certain situations, I know that the conflict is coming. And I'll even kind of like leading up to it, I'll be praying about it. I'll also be kind of stewing over it, you know, kind of worrying about it. There's even times that I have kind of like in my mind worked through some of the potential conversations and how I'm going to handle different things about it. All of that because conflict can be really difficult. But sometimes the truth is, sometimes there are those unfortunate, um, unfortunate situations where conflict is kind of necessary. Now, I don't mean like fighting. I don't mean like physical fighting. I mean sometimes those situations where there needs to be one of those like sit down discussions where man on man, woman on woman, kind of a heart to heart moment with someone. And sometimes again, maybe it's about a specific situation. Maybe it's about something that's happening within a person's life or maybe of how they're reacting or handling something or a certain way. And it doesn't, it's not really panning out the way that you think is proper for them to be acting. Maybe it's not lining up with God's standards and you're trying to hold them to a, a proper standard. You're trying to hold them accountable. Or maybe it's, you know, within work situations, maybe they're not living up to work standards. And if you might be a supervisor, you may have to have those conversations. Or maybe it's even within your family. It's not living up to family or personal standards. And we have to step in and we kind of have to have the talk with them about it. Well, today we're going to see kind of a similar situation that is retold by Paul about a conflict that happened within his life and kind of is the real, the real focus of what we're going to study today in our text in the book of Galatians. So if you have your Bibles and you want to go ahead and start turning there to book of Galatians, uh, we'll have our text up on the screen. You can follow along there. We're going to be in Galatians chapter two. But last week we started this series on the book of Galatians. This And, and, and kind of the theme behind this is that we are standing on God. God's grace. And we, we looked at the very first part of this, this kind of this almost an introduction into the letter and saw how the whole reason we have this letter of Galatians is that Paul uh, was traveling around planting different churches and he, he kind of started a church there in Galatia and kind of got them going, was teaching them and they accepted this message of Jesus and all this and they're growing in that. And then he left to go off on another journey and start some other churches and lead some other people. And when he was gone, there were some people that kind of came in 
men uh, by the name of the, or they were referred to as the Judaizers. And they began to, to teach that Paul only got it half right and that he was kind of missing a little bit more. They said, you know, yes, Jesus is Lord. Yes, you need to accept Jesus. He died for you. Uh, but you need to not only accept Jesus, but you need to add something on to your faith. And specifically, they were calling people to hold to not only faith in Jesus, but also the acceptance and the observance of Old Testament laws and practices. But we saw last week that one of the things right from the get-go that Paul is trying to drive home is this idea that anything plus Jesus equals nothing, that we, we can't add anything on to Jesus. It's all about him. It is in Christ alone that we find our forgiveness, our freedom, our renewal, and our salvation. And as Paul is kind of unpacking this important doctrine to this church, that's the reason he sent this letter to this church and these Christians. He's trying to help them understand this really important doctrine and truth. And it kind of leads him to have to sort of defend his teaching and defend his stance on that. I mean, if you're going to write a letter to somebody and tell them that what they believe or what they're doing is wrong, then you kind of got to back it up and you got to explain yourself to them. And that's what he's doing with this letter, the rest of the letter, especially the first half of it. He's sort of explaining himself, and he's kind of using personal situations to prove why he is right. He even is explaining his own personal experience of the grace of God, of experiencing the grace of God, of going from being a, a Pharisee who was persecuting Christians and even to the point of putting some of them to death. And then uh, this moment when God got a hold of him in church there in Jerusalem, accepted him, accepted him. You see, in Jerusalem, this was kind of like a hub for the church. It's where it kind of things started up. And that where their leaders were. And he was saying that even when I went there, they accepted me and my teaching. But then as, as these leaders are there in Jerusalem, one of the things that he experienced was as they're kind of teaching people and they're, they're, uh, they're, they're sharing the message, they begin to set out from Jerusalem. They begin to leave Jerusalem and share the message of Jesus in other places. And some of them went to other places where other Jews were, and they were sharing with them that they needed to accept Jesus as the Messiah. But then Paul, he leaves Jerusalem and he goes on to places where there were not Jews, there were, there were Gentiles, as they called them. And, and it's in this kind of situation of when these non-Jewish people begin to accept faith that the, that the setting is kind of set in place for this tense situation, for this conflict that's going to happen. Paul shares about this conflict to this church in Galatia, not as, not as gossip or as pointing fingers, but it was meant to point out that his message was a consistent one. And that even when other church leaders might disagree with him and think that he's wrong and doing things incorrectly, that he still held to this doctrine because it was truth. And so he's going to drive home the real foundation of this doctrine through this example of this, of this disagreement, of this argument, of this fight that he kind of has between him and the apostle Peter. We're going to look at these two sides of the situation today in Galatians chapter 2. It's going to start by showing us kind of the actions. Uh, Paul describes Peter's actions and what he did and what he did improperly. And then the second half is really going to look at kind of Paul's almost like his rebuke and his correction, his teaching of it. And really the focus of what we will, really want to get is out of that second section. But we got to kind of see the first part of it to really understand what's going on, why the conflict even happened, so that we can understand Paul's point in for his teaching. So let's jump into this. There's a lot to, to kind of understand with this. Hopefully we can kind of make it through together and, and kind of really get the point of this. We find in Galatians chapter two in verse 11, it says this, when Cephas came to Antioch, now we got to kind of hit pause real quick to make sure we get too, we don't get too far into this and not understand who and what's going on. Cephas is another name for Peter. Oftentimes they had different names that they were referred to by. Sometimes it had to do with um, uh, whether it be uh, social settings or different times it had to do with the different types of people they were around culturally. But here, Cephas is Peter, and Antioch was a church that was full of Gentile Christians. These were, in fact, really, some people believe that this was the very first non-Jewish Christian church um, in, of the ancient world of the first century. And so it says there in verse 11, when Cephas came to Antioch, I, this is being Paul, I opposed him to his, faith, his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas 
was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, or Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So let's kind of pause here. Let's kind of stop and get a good picture of what this is going on, the situation that, that's really got Paul riled up here. Peter, or Cephas, as it was mentioned here in this text, he, he is, he's, um, he's a missionary to the Jews, and he's going around and uh, spreading the gospel, the good news to different uh, Jewish communities. But then he eventually goes to Antioch. And again, Antioch was probably the very first place that there was a non-Jewish community that accepted the message of Christ. And while he's there, these Gentiles are you know, accepting this message. They're becoming Christian. They're following Christ. And so he's spending his life, his time, his, his, he's interacting with them. He says he even is eating with them. And this probably means more than just like sitting at the same table, which really for a Jew was kind of a no-no to sit with other Gentiles. But he was probably also sharing in their food, which is meant that he was also eating a lot of non-kosher or non-Jewish food. And up to this point, uh, that really wasn't acceptable. Jews up to that point had very strict dietary laws that were outlined in the Mosaic law. But if you go to the book of Acts in chapter 10, you actually see that uh, Peter experienced a vision from God. This vision where God uh, brought these animals in front of him, and he said, get up and eat all of it. And, and Peter's like, no, some of these things are unclean. I can't do that. And God tells him, don't, don't call anything that I have made clean, unclean. And he does this for two reasons, that, that he gives him this vision. On the one hand, he's trying to help Peter understand that, hey, listen, it's okay now to eat these animals. That's the reason we can eat some of the things that we eat today, like bacon. And, you know, thank goodness for Smithfield's happy about that. Um, but not only that, and probably more importantly... God is trying to drive home the point that he is calling all people to himself. That for the Jews, it's no longer about looking at non-Jewish communities, non-Jewish people, the Gentiles, and thinking, them, thinking of them as unclean or unworthy of God. No, it was for Jews and Gentiles. In fact, right after this vision, God tells Peter to go to this man's house by the name of Cornelius. And Cornelius was a Roman centurion. And the whole reason he was going there was to preach the good news to him. And in fact, Cornelius's whole family accepts that message and comes to salvation is baptized. So Peter goes now to this place, this place Antioch, where he's living amongst non-Jewish Christians and he's enjoying their fellowship, which is great, which is good. That's what he should be, be doing. But the problem was the moment that these religious leaders show up from Jerusalem, well, Peter has a, a drastic change in his actions. And this was the root of the problem that, Pete, that Paul had with Peter. I want to show you a few things that I think really stand out as the real problem with Peter's actions. The first thing is that it was hypocrisy. The way that he was acting was hypocrisy. Peter is acting one way for one crowd and acting totally different for another crowd. Before those relig religious leaders get there, you know, he's, the, he's spending time with these Gentiles. He's eating with them. Uh, again, probably non-Jewish, non-kosher meals, and he's fine with that. And the reason he's doing this is to build some unity. I mean, it's the same reason we go and eat meals with people today. We want to build relationships. We want to build community and unity with them. And that's a great thing that Peter is doing. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I enjoy doing weddings for non-Christians. There are some ministers that are very adamant. No, you can only do uh, weddings for Christians. You shouldn't do it for non-Christians. But for me, I see it as a great opportunity for me to bridge the gap and kind of build some relationships with people that may never walk through the doors of, the, the, of this church or maybe any other church. And it's a great opportunity to build these connections. And that's, that's what Peter is doing. He's building relationships, building rapport, building bridges. But the problem comes in when those Jewish leaders show up and then who are sent by the church, by James, and then quickly, Peter changes everything. I mean, he won't even sit with them anymore, and he starts acting all, you know, holier than thou and acting different. And, and see, it's okay for us to act different around different groups of people. I mean, we all do that. We get around one group of friends, and you might act a little crazy or a little goofy or a little silly, and you get around that other group of people, and you feel a little more proper and kind of put together with it. But it's when our, it's not only when our the things that we say, but maybe our lifestyle or maybe our values and our beliefs, and we become a different person. That's the real problem. And that's what was going on here. Peter is being someone different, all because 
these, these leaders show up from that church there in Jerusalem, and all because he was afraid of what they would say, which leads to the second thing that was wrong with his situation, in that it was based in fear. It was based in fear. Peter is allowing the fear of what others may think and what others may say to dictate his actions. Now, this is a hard topic, this whole idea of fear, because I think sometimes uh, when people will hear this idea and say that, you know, yeah, we shouldn't let fear dictate how we act. That's one of those things that we love to say, but man, sometimes can be more difficult to kind of live out in our life. And what I mean is that sometimes, you know, it, we, we, we get into situations or we have times where we have to make decisions about things. And sometimes we let that fear kind of creep in and help us decide whether or not we're going to do or not do certain things all based on how people may perceive what we're doing. But fear shouldn't be our motivator for doing good or for doing wrong. We shouldn't be afraid of what people are going to say or think about us, and we shouldn't base our lifestyle on the things we do on those things. We should always, we should always use God's truth. Let Him be the one to help us decide how we're going to live. You know, as a leader, it's probably one of, this is probably one of the most difficult things that I wrestle with sometimes. Um, and, and as being a part of a leadership team within the church, that's one of the things that we wrestle with sometimes. There are times that, you know, as, as a church leader, we have to look at different situations. We have to look at different paths and say, okay, what's the proper direction to head? How is God guiding us? You know, we pray that the Holy Spirit, truth that we allow. And that was one of, big, one of Paul's big problems and issues with Peter's actions. Which then leads to the last real big problem was that it, it wasn't biblical. It wasn't biblical. The things that he was doing, the actions he was taking, they weren't biblical. Paul said that when Peter was acting in one way, it wasn't in line with the truth of the gospel. You see, the gospel, God's word has to be our determining factor, our guiding truth. We can't bounce back and forth between feelings and, and doing these things and actions and just kind of bouncing all around. No, we have got to, we have got to allow God's truth to be the thing that guides us. And that's, that's why it's so important that we learn God's word. I mean, if we don't know God's word, how can we live by God's word? That was a big part of the reason why we started this year with that series on how to study the Bible. That was a big reason why we, we, we studied passages like Psalm 119, where it says, how can a young person, or I would say, how can any person stay on a path of purity by living according to your word? You see, Peter wasn't allowing God's standards to guide his actions, he was allowing fear. And because of that, he was living in hypocrisy and he wasn't living according to God's truth. And, and, and the real danger for living one way for one crowd and another way for another crowd, well, Paul's gonna kind of unpack that here in the second half of this passage. So in verse 15, let's pick up, it says, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I, will really, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Now look, that's a lot of heavy, deep talk that Paul is trying to drive home this real point. And this is really, I would say in so, so many ways, the crux of Paul's issue with Peter's actions. This is why Paul is upset with Peter going back and forth. This is the reason that Paul is frustrated with Peter's actions because of what it's communicating to people around him. The reason that Paul is telling the church in Galatia about this situation, about the argument that he had between him and Peter, is that the, the, the Galatian Christians, you remember, they were being convinced and told by people 
that they had to add something to Jesus, like the Old Testament customs and laws. And by Peter flip-flopping back and forth, just because these, these Jewish leaders came in, it was reinforcing that same message that they needed something more than Jesus. And so Paul drives home and really, you know, pushes hard on this message of what it really should be. The first thing is that the old rules are gone. He's trying to help them understand that these old rules are gone. What Paul is, is saying is that a person is not justified by the works of the law, meaning you can't find forgiveness in salvation by following the Old Testament laws. It is only found in faith in Christ Jesus because of what he did for us on our behalf by taking our place on the cross and trusting in his sacrifice. You see, following a bunch of rules is not going to save them and is not going to save us. We don't follow the rules to be saved. Now, we do follow God's commands. We do follow the commands that he's given us, but it's not so that we can be saved, but because he has saved us. It is our obedience to him, his faithfulness. And this is why Jesus even said in John 14, 15, it's recorded, if you love me, keep my commands. And just, this just kind of makes sense, right? It makes sense for us that if we love Jesus, if we love him, we're going to do our best to live life his way. And it's not about perfection. It's not about being super holy. It's about showing our love for him, our appreciation for him and what he has done for saving us. And so we aren't justified or forgiven because of the things we might do or like Peter was trying to do by avoiding sinful things, or by, but by receiving Jesus's gift of salvation. So the old rules are gone. We are no longer saved by observing the Old Testament laws and rules. In fact, I don't think anyone was ever saved by observing the Old Testament rules um, at all. And, and really, neither does Paul. He says this in Romans 9, 30. What shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained, have attained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not obtained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. You see, even the Old Testament law was really never meant to save us because the law pointed to Jesus. The law pointed us to Jesus because the Bible tells us that those who live by the law are going to die by the law. Because if you're going to try and keep, if you're going to try and keep the law, you've got to keep all of it. And if you fail in one part of it, well, then you have failed in all of it. But praise God, we don't have to live that way. That's why in verse 19, Paul said, though, uh, for, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I, I love what New Testament professor Michael DeFazio said about this. He said, Paul actually believes that the way to be the most faithful to the law of Moses is to actually no longer regard the law of Moses as being the means of receiving justification. The law itself actually points us forward to when we would lean into Jesus and let go of the law. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. You see, friends, the whole reason we have these Old Testament laws, and I've been reading through it. I just finished up Leviticus this past week, and I'm like, praise the Lord, I'm done with that book, man. Good night. Um, but the whole reason we have these Old Testament laws, and, and truly the whole reason we have all of the Old Testament is to point us ahead, to point us ahead to Jesus. And so when we look at our lives, the manner in which we judge our lives, it should not be about how much good have we done, how many good deeds, how many good things have I done, or how much bad have I avoided, how much sin and temptation have I overcome. Because if we're going to make it all about the law, then the answer is no, we haven't done enough. No, we haven't been good enough. No, we haven't avoided enough bad things. But it's not about that. The question is, did I trust in Jesus? I mean, that's why he made that point there in verse 20 where he says, and I love this verse. This is a, if there is a spot to outline and underline in your, in your Bible, it is this right here. Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, 
I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. That, my friends, right there is the gospel, the good news of Jesus contained in those verses that I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's the fact that we have been made new. We have been made new. Our, our old selves, where we tried to measure up, where we tried to succeed in being a Christian, of being good, of being, you know, following the ch- checklist of rules, that's what's been put to death. But Paul says, no more. It's not about me striving. It's not about me working. It's about allowing Jesus to live through me. And the person that I am today, it's not somehow I achieved who I am. Paul says it's not because of anything I've done. It's not anything that I've made myself into. It's because I've allowed the old self to be crucified and to be made new. Friends, this is why, this is one of the reasons why we make such a big deal out of baptism here at this church. We, now look, we are not saved by the water that's in that baptistry. That, ba- that water in that baptistry came out of a well over in the woods, okay? There's nothing special about that water there. There's nothing special about the person who does the baptizing there in that situation. No, we are saved by the grace of Jesus and his grace that comes to us through his sacrifice. But Romans 6, 3 tells us this, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. When we're baptized, we participate in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. We die to our old self. We die to the sins that held us down and separate us from Jesus. We die to having to measure up and somehow meet the requirements that the law may put on us. That's why we make such a big deal out of baptism, because so does God. So does God's word. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And when we allow Christ to live in us, when we allow him to live out our, through us and the things that we do, the way we treat people, the way we interact with people, meaning that my actions, my attitudes reflect him, so then I will follow his commandments. Man, that's when we begin to see him living through us. So let me kind of bring this around now, all this different stuff about these arguments, this discussion, this doctrine. I want to finish really with, with a question for you this morning. And it's a question that I think really comes from this whole teaching and the whole reason that, that Paul is sharing this, this dispute and this argument that he had with, with Peter there. I think it's a question that each one of us needs to wrestle with because remember, Peter was conveying with his flip-flopping back and forth that we somehow have to measure up to a certain standard that we know that we can't meet. But what Paul is helping us to try, what he's trying to help us see is that it's not about me measuring up It's about Jesus and accepting his sacrifice. So the question I want to kind of finish up with here for each of us to wrestle with and and to grapple with is if you were to stand before God today, why should he allow you into heaven? And and, and again, this is not one of those questions just like, I'm going to fill in the blank. I'm good to go. I'm done with today. No, I, I want you to wrestle with that for a moment. If you were to stand before God today, why should he allow you into heaven? And maybe your answer is, well, you know, I, I've done this and this, and I've, I've served in this way, and I've, I've sacrificed in that way, and I've done these things, and I've gone to that place, and I've been with these people, and I've done all these. And look, if your answer starts with I, then it's not good enough, okay? And I'm just sorry to say that. If the answer starts with I, it's not good enough. But if your answer starts with Jesus, well, Jesus saved me. Jesus forgave me. Jesus made me new. If your answer starts with Jesus, then that's the right answer. But maybe maybe your answer is neither of those. Maybe your answer is, well, I don't know why he would let me in. I don't know that he really even should let me in. Friends, you can have the assurance today. John wrote, he said, I write that they can know that they have salvation. We can have the assurance today that when we stand before God, we can say, because of Jesus, and he can welcome us in. 
not because of anything we've done, but because of Jesus. Today, we can put our faith, our trust in Jesus. We can put our hope in his sacrifice and trust in him day by day, moment by moment. And you can even participate in his death, burial, burial, and resurrection. We keep this, this baptistry is all warmed up. I checked it this morning. It's ready to go. We've got a change of clothes for you. We've got towels ready for you. There is nothing keeping you back, no reason holding you back from making that decision and taking that step of rising to a new life in Christ other than you saying, eh, I don't think so, not today. But why would you wait? Why would you hold back another moment when Jesus is saying, I'm just waiting for you. I'm waiting to be your answer. I'm waiting for you to trust in me and not in yourself. And just a little bit, the praise team's gonna come up. And you know, every week we end our service with a song. And, and, and sometimes that song is just another way to wrap up the service. But today, I, man, I, I, wanna, I wanna challenge you. In this moment when we sing the song, uh, the song is graves into garden. And that's what God does. He changes the crud and the, the mess of our life, the grave of our heart, of our soul into a garden. He can make us brand new. If you have never accepted Jesus on his terms, today needs to be the day. Today needs to be the day that you do that, that you don't walk out of here and wait another day. And in fact, in, in a little while, while we're singing that song, uh, the elders, we're going to be in the back. Beth, Ashley, we're going to be in the back. We would love to, to pray with you today. If you need to make that step, make that decision and do that today, don't wait. But maybe there's something else you need to pray about. Maybe there's something else on your heart, something else that's keeping you back from fully accepting and trusting in him instead of yourself. Whatever it might be, when we sing that song in a little bit, I want to challenge you to come back and find us so we can help you take those steps today. Friends, it's not about me. It's not about I. It's not about what I can do. It's about trusting in Jesus, and I hope you'll do that. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you. We thank you that you would love us enough in the face of our selfishness, in the face of our attempts to do it on our own, in the face of our arrogance to think that we can somehow clean up our own lives, get ourselves straight, get ourselves on the right path. Just as Paul wrote there, if, if we could somehow be saved by following the rules, then Jesus died for nothing. But we know that's not true. We know that we need you, Jesus. And Father, right now, I pray for those I pray for those right now that are, that are on the fence, that hear your words, that are hearing your spirit knock on the door, maybe banging on the door, and are struggling with whether or not to do it. God, I pray that they would not keep the door shut any longer. I pray that they would open that door and welcome you in today. Father, give them the courage that they need to take that step of just letting go and surrendering, knowing that it's no longer about what we do, it's about trusting in you. We thank you so much for that sacrifice and that gift. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, why don't we stand together? If you need to make a decision today to accept Christ for the first time, if you need to make a decision to rededicate your heart, your life to him for the hundredth time, whatever it might be, you come find us.